All right. Um, I guess we will go ahead and get started with this. Uh, I'm told this is the first workshop now for um, Unstable Summit, so thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Edwin Naoki. I am the CTO of PayPal's Blockchain, Crypto, and Digital Currencies Unit. I am joined here by Ilan. Yeah, I'm the engineering manager for uh, the blockchain team at Paxos, which is the um, regulated issuer of PayPal USD. Happy to be here. And uh, yeah, we're both happy to be here, and we are uh, here to engage all of you in a conversation around what you want from your stablecoin. Um, as you know, PYUSD is still fairly young in this space, uh, and that gives us a unique opportunity to engage with all of you to help steer the course of how we make this more useful, how we make this more valuable, and how we make this uh, more uh, easily accessible for you all in the developer ecosystem to participate uh, with us in PYUSD. So let me maybe start with a short history of how uh, PYUSD came to be and what PayPal's involvement is in the crypto space. Um, and then we'll jump into a conversation uh, where really we want to hear from you and we want you to be, uh, your voice to be part of the evolution and the journey of how we move forward with uh, PYUSD as the premier stablecoin for payments. Um, so uh, as we're doing this, feel free to get close. Um, we want to have this be a, a discussion rather than a, uh, uh, a lecture. Um, but I'll start off by just sharing a little bit about the journey to PYUSD uh, at PayPal. And Elon will speak a little bit about the structure of uh, our reserves and how uh, we work with Paxos uh, around the issuing and the minting of the, of the coin. So, you know, our goal uh, within the BCDC unit at PayPal is to help move commerce uh, uh, from online to on-chain in much the same way that PayPal helped move commerce from offline to online some 20 plus years ago. Um, we started this journey at a really interesting point where we understood that uh, finance and payments and the digital space were really starting to evolve in new and interesting ways. Uh, we saw that there was huge demand coming from our consumers around a great, uh, greater amount of choice in how they pay and how they use uh, uh, and interact with financial systems and services. And at the same time, we saw that there was a tremendous opportunity to improve the way that money and value moves globally around the world. Now, we knew that we couldn't move from sort of zero to issuing a stable coin overnight. So we went through a process where we helped to uh, bring uh, cryptocurrencies to our consumer audience uh, by uh, launching in 2020 with our buy and sell uh, business. Some of you may or may not know that today you can actually use Bitcoin or Ethereum or a couple of other currencies to actually pay at almost any of the 30 million plus uh, merchants that we offer at PayPal. If you have uh, a crypto in your PayPal wallet, um, you can use that to pay at almost any PayPal merchant around the world today. Um, and that was a way that both we got additional uh, visibility into how to operate uh, uh, with Paxos and, and uh, bring these to consumers, uh, and also to work within the confines of our regulatory environment and with our uh, uh, stakeholders around the world to really start to bring crypto to the masses. And that was really the first step that we made into this space. A short while later, we expanded to Venmo, we expanded to the UK, and we opened up the, uh, uh, the wallet to being able to receive and send uh, uh, crypto to other external wallets uh, anywhere else in the world. We felt from the beginning that this needed to be an open system. We felt that we wanted to be uh, uh, responsible participants in the ecosystem, and we wanted to promote and help folks get on board with crypto. And that's why we partnered with folks like Ledger and uh, MetaMask and Phantom to bring easy and efficient on-ramps and off-ramps. So today, again, if you want to fund your MetaMask wallet with Ethereum, um, you can do that in two clicks uh, with your PayPal account. Uh, it's really fast and, and, and simple. But that was never really the final goal. Our final goal was to be able to streamline payments and streamline transactions. Uh, and to do that, we knew that we wanted to have a stable, safe, easily transferable source of value and that led to PYUSD, our stablecoin, which we announced and launched in August of uh, last year. Um, so we're about six months in now, if I'm doing my math correctly. And um, you know, we're thrilled with how that's going. But as I said, we are now in the sort of early stages of really coming and um, engaging with you as developers and as builders in this community and 
the point of our conversation today is to really uh, help us understand how we can evolve this to make this more useful for you. So um, before I get into that, let me turn it over to Elon to talk a little bit about how uh, PYUSD is structured and the role that Paxos plays uh, in, uh, in the issuance and the reserve management for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, really interesting hearing about the, the history and where we're going and, and where we've been. So Paxos is the regulated issuer of PayPal USD. Uh, we are the infrastructure platform and technology provider to enterprise um, uh, partners like PayPal here. And Paxos's role is to enable the enterprise partners like PayPal to build their stablecoin on our regulated infrastructure and um, to be able to use it in an agnostic way on their front end for end users and customers. Uh, our issued stablecoin PYUSD and its reserves are strictly um, regulated by uh, the New York Department of Financial Services, that's the NYDFS, one of the top regulators in the country. And all of the reserves are held 100% in US dollar deposits, securities, or um, not securities, absolutely not, uh, US treasuries and cash equivalents, meaning that customer funds are available for one-to-one -one redemption at any time. Uh, our Reserves are also audited monthly by a top auditor and available on our website, including down to the QCIP, so you know exactly what is making up the reserves at any given time. Our customer assets or customer assets are protected from bankruptcy, and they are fully segregated. This is um, even by law, so the New York banking um, law means that customer assets are always their assets. If uh, Paxos is ever insolvent for any reason, we are unable to use those deposits or any of the reserves to um, use for our own business practices or for obligations for our own debts. And um, this is extremely important for any user of PayPal USD to know that their token is their token on chain. It can never be used by Paxos for our own business uses. And I will pass it back to Edwin to talk a bit about payments and kick us off with the workshop. Yeah, so we're not going to spend a ton of time beyond that talking a little bit about the advantages of, of PYUSD. This group, more than anybody, knows how stable coins work and, and, and all of that. But one of the things that we feel like we bring to this party is the payments aspect. Because a lot of times when we talk about sort of moving funds around and moving value around, we talk about it as if it's a sort of one and done operation. But those of you who may be um, you know, working with payments, uh, those of you who may need to collect payments for a game or an application that you're working on, know that the real world is a little bit messier than that, right? There are refunds, there are disputes, there are claims that happen. Uh, and you know, our goal with PYUSD is to be able to also facilitate the larger ecosystem around subscriptions, around um, uh, uh, customer servicing, around disputes management, around returns, around all of those things that really make a payment more than just the movement of you know, some amount of value that, that, that goes back and forth. Um, and that's sort of what we want to bring. But it's also you know, uh, 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 what we think is uh, valuable for you all. And what we want to get to now is what you think is valuable for you all. Because as I said, there is an opportunity, we're still fairly early on, to um, direct how we engage with you, how we integrate, the kinds of tools and services and, and documentation that we offer um, to make integrating with payments, not just integrating with stable coins, uh, useful and easy for you in your dApps uh, and, um, uh, uh, and applications. So we had a couple of questions, but you know, this is a small group. It's fairly free-flowing. Um, you are welcome to come further forward to engage in the conversation. We do not bite much. Um, but uh, you know, again, this is really about um, how we make this better for you. And the first thing that I'll mention is, you know, as we've been talking to developers and, and um, entrepreneurs around the, uh, around the ecosystem, uh, one of the things that we heard was, Hey, how do we get started? Where's your test net? How do we get a faucet so that we can start playing with this? Uh, and so I'm pleased to announce that in conjunction with Paxos, today we are launching the PYUSD uh, test net on Sepolia. Um, so if you go to faucet.paxos.com, there are some cards back up there. Um, you can start getting started with uh, PYUSD 
uh, on the test net. Um, you can start um, to uh, engage with that. Um, but you know, we've already started to see some really interesting uh, real-world use cases uh, that I'll just start off from, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to all of you to help us understand what you want to use your stable coins for. Um, about a month ago, uh, our ventures arm, PayPal Ventures, actually did the first uh, VC funding with PYUSD. So uh, we invested in a company called Mesh, um, and a significant portion of that funding round was uh, funded with PYUSD, which eliminates um, you know, a lot of the uncertainties around wires and bank transfers and other things that happen for uh, founders at the sort of throes of their funding rounds. Uh, we have worked with uh, our vendors, so we do some of our vendor payments now from PayPal with PYUSD and, and allow those people to get paid more quickly and more readily uh, 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 and more efficiently for them. Uh, and we've been working with partners like Yellowcard to be able to also streamline the movement of value across borders uh, so that you can now send money from the, uh, your Venmo account in, uh, here in Denver to uh, a recipient in Malawi. Uh, for a much cheaper, faster, and, and more transparent uh, uh, rate than uh, you could with traditional remittance services. So these are some of the things that we've been really pleased to see uh, developers and, and founders and entrepreneurs doing with uh, the stablecoin so far. Um, but again, we're here to learn from you. So um, what would you like to see? What are the kinds of use cases that you'd like to see? What are you thinking about? Um, what are the things that we're not seeing uh, in this space where PYUSD could be helpful? And I'm going to pass this around, and I'm going to randomly call on people if people don't uh, actually say anything. So be forewarned. Yeah, anyone want to kick it off? Yeah, come on in. Um, yeah, uh, I do a lot of Solid development, and I work at Open Zeppelin, um, which I know some of the components found its way into both uh, uh, the Paxos and then later PYUSD. So I guess I'm, uh, I guess I'm curious. Do you have any kind of comments on the design or unique aspects of the token itself that's been deployed in Ethereum in terms of like how you'd compare against USDC or Tether, whether it's gas efficiency or additional features? I, I saw a few things in the code, so maybe I, I have some ideas about it, but I'd love to hear it from y'all. Yeah, what was your name? Uh, Michael. Michael. All right, thank you for the question. Uh, and for Open Zeppelin, really great. Uh, yeah, so we tend to use as many standard pieces as possible, right? We want to make sure that our token is extremely reliable um, more than anything else and safe. So having tools like Open Zeppelin have been extremely helpful in that process. Um, and we have, you know, it is upgradable through the proxy pattern as is most uh, stable coins at this point. And so we are developing a number of new features. Actually, Henrik here, who's in the audience, is, um, is leading the team that's doing a lot of that work. And uh, maybe you two might want to connect after, too. Uh, yeah, so some things that we are excited about are things that are um, readily available in some other tokens. But I'm excited about some of the use cases that we can enable with them through our partnerships with PayPal and through other partnerships with other on-chain uh, companies related to, you know, delegated transfers, right? Um, using something akin to EIP three zero zero nine to be able to do that is something that I'm really excited about. Um, gas efficiency is something that I know we're looking at and looking at improving how we can do that. While when we were launching, the number one thing, as I mentioned, was security and stability at the beginning, and then additional features that we're looking to enable are things that um, were actually, I would love to hear from you all as part of that as well. How important is account abstraction in, you know, in servicing those types of wallets better? How can we do um, improvements on our side as well? I would almost turn the question back to you. Is there something that you wish was in there that you maybe don't know of, or do you see of any, or do you know of anything that you feel like would be awesome to have a stable coin adopt, but you haven't really seen adopt yet? Um, I would definitely second like the account abstraction support, but with the caveat of what will account abstraction look like when it's kind of become stable. Um, we've worked with the Ethereum Foundation to audit them, so we know that it's still kind of a work in progress in terms of how wallets will support it. But yeah. but but I saw the the delegation by SIG, which is just kind of general meta transaction support. So that's great to have because I think that's the number one thing. If someone has a stable coin in their wallet, they might not have Ether in it too. So having someone else transferred on their behalf is like a great, much better user experience. Um, I guess other than that, like maybe 
I, I know the Solidity compiler version that's currently being used is like 4.9, but you're, you're still using safe math and other things to protect against that, but I'd be curious to know if you, you think it would be worth using a later compiler. Uh, I know there's a balance between using code that you've already secured and you know works versus upgrading for the sake of just staying up to date. Uh, but yeah, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, it's something we're looking at and actively working on um, a bit to, to be able to upgrade to a newer version. Of course, we, again, wanted to just be safe when we launched. And so that was the number one concern. Um, and now that we have more time and are able to put more resources into how, being thoughtful about what we upgrade to and how um, is something that we're, we're definitely looking at um, as far as the compiler version is concerned. Sweet. Um, yeah, and I guess one final th Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll. I, I was just going to ask, is there any considerations for going cross-chain? And if so, is there, have you thought about any ways you might do that, similar to like how USDC is doing it? Or, um, yeah, if there's any considerations in your roadmap for that? Okay, it's, it's, it's almost like I planted that question. So I, I was going to say that you know, we, we've designed PYUSD from the beginning, and our, it was our intention to be uh, multi-chain from the start. Um, we started with a fairly standard ERC-20 uh, for compatibility so that we could very quickly engage and get the, um, the acceptance and the uh, distribution that would really allow for more of these use cases to be relevant, right? Like the yellow card folks implemented very quickly because it was already in ERC-20. Uh, we were able to leverage the uh, existing ex expertise and the security guarantees that Paxos had against some of their additional con existing contracts because we were able to do that. Um, but it was and has been our intention from the beginning to be multi-chain. Um, we continue to evaluate various L1s and L2s for what those next chains will be. Um, actually, maybe an interesting aside, are, what are the interesting chains for you? Because, again, we have our ideas, but um, there's nothing better than actually hearing from the makers that are, that are actually using them. Um, but to, to sort of get back to your earlier question, we very intentionally went with something that was not revolutionarily different um, because we wanted it to be easy for the MetaMasks, for the ledgers, for the yellow cards of the world to get started with it. And now that we have that base, we're here to try to figure out what are the right evolutions that then add that value on top. Sweet. Thank you. So, um, hi. My name is Ryo. Um, actually, with Paxos, but I mean, I have a, a question to you because you you mentioned the whole um, the refund topic. So b back in the day, I started a couple of startups, and uh, one of them was in a was a marketplace. And um, in the whole group of friends of, uh, of of founders back then, there was like always this pain of like you have to deal with these claims, the refunds. It was a big part of your business that you didn't really want to worry about. I know there were startups trying to to white label that you find a solution for you know all kinds of marketing or your know, marketplaces. Um, I don't think it was ever really solved in the white label. So you mentioned that you want to bring this in because PayPal solves this, of course, or solves it for eBay and stuff like that. And so I'm really curious. Um, I always you know, see the, the crypto space as something that's sent and done. <laughs> um, and so I'm like, really interested to hear uh, if I'm a developer that is interesting to sell products, whether that's a game or in-game product or whatever, how do I deal with claims and, and refunds? You know, it's a big question that developers have to deal with. What is, your, what is your thought on that? Yeah, so you know, I think that the way to think about that is that there's sort of a payment layer, right? So that is the movement of, well, so there's the transaction layer, which is the movement of value, in this case, on chain. Um, and then there's the sort of commerce layer that sits on top of that. And so that actually starts even further back before the refunds, right? Because you need, to, if, if you're receiving, uh, whether it's stablecoin or crypto, to a specific wallet address, you first need to be able to associate that with an invoice or a transaction or an order or something else that comes in. So there's a layer involved that sort of starts by associating some transactional element that you have in your system with, or, or, with regards to a purchase or an order with the actual value transfer that happens. There may also need to be some uh, engagement with things like anti-fraud and, and, and risk behaviors that then come in to make sure that those payments are um, are legitimate and that both sides are protected uh, from that. Once you have that um, sort of connection, now you have the ability to be able to do things like reversals, uh, refunds, and other sorts of things because you're able to associate a larger transactional context to 
the movement of value across chain. That's not always going to be possible for straight transfers, for you know, movements to uh, uh, unhosted wallets and various other sorts of things. But for us, the idea is that we can actually tie a, you know, for example, when you are doing a transfer into the PayPal system today of any crypto, um, users have the ability and really the recommendation that a unique wallet address gets generated for every one of those transfers. For merchants, we can then associate that, or we would be able to associate that with a specific order or a specific activity that then allows us to understand sort of the traces and the movements of those, of those flows across. So those are the kinds of things that we're thinking about as layers on top of the actual movement of PYUSD that we can then bring um, through SDKs. Uh, we have a partnership with Fireblocks for, for merchants that um, you know, does settlement in PYUSD um, and other sorts of things so that if you are building a, you know, a, 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 a great, game, if you're building something, um, you know, a, a, a dApp uh, that has a commerce capability that you will not only be able to associate the transaction on the way in with whatever your order is, but also that you'll be able to do a lot of that post-transaction work on the back end. And again, these are the kinds of things where, you know, we're still early in being able to put all of this, in, in putting all of this together. So this is where you can help us to say, is this important? Right? There's, a, there's a view in crypto that it should be one and done, and that the irreversibility is a feature, and therefore you know, dealing with things like returns or disputes just shouldn't be part of the equation. I, I'm not sure that all of our merchants would necessarily agree with that, but if that, is the, if, if that is a strongly held belief here, that's actually a really important data point for us. Yeah, in the back. Um, hey, uh, Hugh Rhodes. Uh, the company is Friday, building consumer credit. I know Paul Bensis as well. Um, Small and actually, world. weirdly, Henrik, you and I met at I think at a at a Bitcoin conference in L.A. maybe <laughs> six or seven years ago. Um, so I actually I think the opposite is true. Uh, I mean, the, the idea that immutability is something that consumers are desperate for, as opposed to returns, refunds, warranties, that's absurd. Um, and actually, as you're describing the features that you're layering, um, I'm, I'm curious, and I don't, I'm not trying to like ask anything proprietary, but are, are you bumping up against uh, MasterCard, Visa? Are you starting to think about that service layer all the way up? Because arguably, that is a large part of their value. I, it's a great question, Hugh. I mean, I don't know that... Um I'm not sure I would agree that that's a huge part of their value. Um, you know, certainly MasterCard and Visa, which you know are, are partners of PayPal, and, and and we work with them a lot on our fiat business. Um, they provide a way of moving value between banks and between issuers and acquirers in a fairly efficient way globally. Um, you know, I think that you know, for example, one of the reasons why people prefer to use PayPal and sites that they're not familiar with is because we offer a set of guarantees on top of that. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know, even in the crypto space, we've extended that. So if you're holding crypto with us and your account gets hacked and, uh, and taken over and somebody extracts a bunch of crypto, we guarantee that up to 50 grand. Um, uh, and, and those are things that we do as a payment provider that is not associated with the banking rails or the crypto or the, or I, the card I rails. I didn't mean versus, I, I meant like Visa, MasterCard versus crypto. Yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah. saying no, that I, the I, service I, layer, uh, you know, life is messy. I, I, right? I get it, yeah. Uh, I, I guess my point is that, you know, I, I, I think that Visa and MasterCard, you know, their, uh, their main proposition right now is to be able to facilitate that actual bottom movement of funds between banks. Um, and it's the service providers that are already providing, like PayPal um, and others that are providing that value. And I think that those will always be the folks that provide that value. We think that we're pretty well positioned to do that into the crypto space because we've got a lot of that infrastructure and, and, and support already. Um, I don't think that we'll be the only ones uh, by any means. But I'm not, I'm not sure that that's an area that Visa and, and, and MasterCard are particularly worried about with crypto. I think they're worried that, it's gonna, that crypto will come and start to eat into their settlement uh, activities uh, more than that. 
Thanks for the question. But, you know, actually, I think, um, you know, one of the questions came up up here that I'd love to, to, to dig into a little bit around cross-chain uh, support. Um, what are the chains that you all are interested in? If, we, if, if you were sitting in this seat and you could direct our folks over at Paxos and our folks over at PayPal and says, we're going to launch a new chain tomorrow or a new L2, what, what should that be? Solana. Zinc, optimism, optimism. And Ethereum Classic. Oh, yeah. I'm real. Okay. <laughs> and 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 those were easy, but I'm going to make this a little bit. Why? Ethereum Classic is the largest proof of work EVM, largest proof of work smart contract network. Proof of work is proven. Proof of stake is not. It's proving right now, but it's not proven. Security. Okay. Mutability on the L1. Mutable in the contracts, in the assets on top of it, sure. But on the L1, security, stable. Okay. That's why. So that's the, that's the argument for... Yeah, all you were talking about, integrating. Yep. It's supported everywhere. Okay. I would say, does it have significant TBL over roughly 200 million? Has it been deployed and operating safely for at least a year? And as a roll-up, does it at least try to adhere to some of the mechanisms? There's going to be safeguards and caveats, but has it... It genuinely implemented some of those features um, to the point where it can be considered a somewhat safer than like a normal sidechain. Yep. In the case of Polygon, it's just the biggest one that people are using. Right. Uh, that is a sidechain. Okay. And Hugh, you said Solana. Um, uh, robust, uh, non-transferable uh, token standard. I mean, I, I know you can do so bound, but the truth of the matter is, when you're dealing with these kind of things. At a certain point, you're going to be identified, either you know pseudonymously or whatever. It's got to be tied to a person, to fraud, etc. And Solana's got a robust, non-transferable standard. Okay. Anybody else? Things I did, names I did not hear include Sui, include Aptos, include Near. <laughs> Near, yeah. Base. Base. Stellar. Stellar, yeah. OK, interesting. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll take that note. Um, was not expecting Ethereum Classic to come up, so. <laughs> the hash rate just moved over this year. That's why. Great. Um, all right, um, maybe one other thing for us, and then maybe we can open up for some questions. Um, some, uh, I mean, like you've been asking some great questions so far. But um, you know, as I said, we just launched our um, in conjunction with Paxos, we just launched our faucet and our testnet support, um, which we're excited about and hope that you will uh, start to engage with at uh, faucet.paxos.com. Um, but what is your preferred integration mechanism? Straight APIs, straight to the blockchain? Would you rather, you know, there's a huge uh, presence here from um, uh, AWS over at the main conference, for example. Would you prefer to go in through that or through Fireblocks or through other um, you know, sort of uh, uh, providers and, and platforms. Um, what, what, what can we do to make it easier for you all to use PYUSD other than just handing out a bunch of cash? Is, is there a specific use case in mind, like retail, DeFi? Uh, it's your specific use case that you want to do. In the case of DeFi, uh, it would be listing any how your ERC-20 compatible, what your... Oh, yeah. So I, I do security work for Compound as well. So we list assets as collateral. We also have like major stable coins like Tether and USDC. Tether is a good example of a... It's kind of ERC-20, but there are caveats to that. So saying... Uh, ha having clear documentation, we actually have a checklist I could send to y'all that we tell every asset to follow. So just to very clearly post, this is how we're ERC-20 compliant. These are the potential risks you run integrating with us. We could pause, we could blacklist, but if we do, this is a team you should get in contact with, or rather, this is how we, you should want to coordinate. So for example, USDC upgraded their token about a month ago. We had security monitoring that detected it, and we're like, well, it looks like they upgraded. Nothing broke, so I guess we're good, but there was no forewarning. Right. And we just we saw an update after like a day or two where they were like, this is why we did it, super minor stuff, but. Uh, I would say like a big advantage would be to say, hey, this, you don't have to say everything because sure. there's some, 
advantage to being obscure about your security posture, but saying this, these are the policies you can expect from us. And yes, we will follow the law. If there are sanctions, there, we will do this. But in general, as a DeFi protocol, as long as you can accept these risks, and if you integrate with USDC or Tether, you probably already do, you don't have anything to worry about. Got it. Okay, so that transparency. Absolutely. Other things? How about in the nuts and bolts? You all know how to do this, and we just, just need to get out of your way, is what I'm hearing. I've got, I've got a, uh, a specific use case, and I'm probably the least technical person here. I, I put on events like this one, so I'm a, more of an event producer. But I do this in, in Denver, New York, Paris, Brussels, Singapore, Korea. You know, it's, it's very international when it comes to the Web3 global crypto conference circuit. There's all these side events, and I'm responsible for managing the payments to all of the vendors. I always like to use local uh, producers for swag, um, musicians, venues. Um, none of them, none of them ever accept crypto. The key to, I mean, getting, getting them to accept crypto takes an onboarding step. You need an on-ramp and an off-ramp before you can accept the payments. So I'm wondering, What's, what's like PayPal's role going to be in, I guess, onboarding international small businesses uh, as a step to actually making payments here? Yeah. No, it's a great, it's a great point. And, and since you mentioned swag, I should mention here that there are some beanies on the back here that uh, you can grab on your way out. Um, it's, uh, it's still a little chilly here in Denver, so uh, that, might, uh, that might be something for you. Um, Look, we think that on-ramps and off-ramps are vital. Um, you know, we, like I said, have started in the U.S. Uh, you know, with our customer base to make it easy for them to onboard onto crypto more generally, but to PYUSD specifically, um, that if you already have a PayPal account uh, or you're t t dealing with a PayPal merchant, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you do have to go through some KYC, and you have to go through because in the U.S. there are assets, and so there's some some uh, uh, information reporting that we need to do. But for the most part, you can get started pretty easily. Um, internationally, it's a little bit more of a mixed bag. Um, we work with a number of exchanges um, and uh, uh, outlets around the world. So we've got what 23 exchanges, I think, that now. Um, accept PYUSD or, or, or work with PYUSD, um, we think, and we haven't published these numbers, but we think there's probably about a half billion folks uh, and wallets out there that are PYUSD enabled or enableable um, uh, across all of those uh, areas. And so chances are that there's already a way that people can get that into a local wallet or a, into, a, into a local exchange. That last mile is tricky, and we are working, you know, one of the things that we've got um, at PayPal is a global distribution network for our remittances business called Zoom. Um, we're looking at ways that we may be able to activate some of those partners. We're looking at ways that we can work with folks like Yellow Card, uh, who has 60 some odd countries in Africa that they work with, um, and that's a pretty efficient way to offboard into local currencies there. Um, but we think that, that Streamlining both the on and off is going to be really key to mainstreaming this. But there isn't really a reason for people to use it unless there's also those use cases around payments, around commerce. So there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem there. We're hoping that what we can do with our two-sided network and the 400 million some odd people that we've got in it can actually start to break that because we actually have both the chicken and the egg in our network and start to encourage both of those, those aspects. Yeah, I might um, poll the audience a little bit on your previous question uh, to try to get some, some response. So I'm curious of uh, the folks that are here for your own stablecoin usage, um, if I can get a show of hands if you acquired, and I'll go through a few of them. So you don't have to just answer once, raise your hand for any of these that apply. Um, if you have acquired a stablecoin through a DeFi protocol. Okay, great, um, really useful to know, pretty solid representation of the audience there. How about directly with the issuer? Also pretty good amount of people, which is interesting to see. Um, for those of you that integrated with the issuer directly, was it through a UI? 
Yeah? Or an API? Only one. OK, so UI seems to be the way there. Um, are there other ones that should be? Yeah, how about through an exchange? Um, let's do non-DeFi, like DEX or something. Way less. Yeah, that's interesting. Any others that I didn't miss that people would be curious? I think those are most of them. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, were you? Oh, I thought you were raising. Yeah. yeah. On off ramp in Canada. On off ramp in Canada. Uh, I do not believe that we have an on off ramp in Canada right now. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'll, I, I will take that back to our team um, as a as a as an ask for you. Um. So, so one thing that I also realize more and more, particularly in the U.S., is that sometimes it's a question: How do you get your crypt, how do you transfer your crypto, your blockchain assets into U.S. dollars? And uh, obviously, I'm happy to see that PayPal is maybe you know becoming in one of these off ramps. But are you concerned, as PayPal, as this big brand, that this might become a route for people to illicitly, you know, hide, use it as an off ramp to get you know all of crypto into into U.S. dollars? Yeah. Where there maybe it's really hard right now to find another way that is not as controlled. I mean, uh, you know, w w one of the things that I think that we bring to the on and off ramp space is the history and the experience that we have around uh, the fiat network. And so, you know, if you have a PayPal account, we do already know some things about you, and we already are able to vet. Um, you know, how fiat moves in and out of those, those areas. So we think that we have a pretty good handle on being able to manage terrorist financing or money laundering or other illicit activities, especially in the interface to the traditional financial system and the, and the fiat world. So, you know, we actually think that we're better positioned than most people uh, in the ability to uh, allow legitimate users to be able to take crypto and bring them into the fiat space um, and into US dollars and be able to do good things with them. Because for the most part, the people on the PayPal platform are already doing uh, uh, money movement and, and uh, interactions with the other parts of the financial system and commerce. Um, and you know, so we, we have that history. And so if you now suddenly start doing that with crypto, we know that you're a good customer. I guess just here and then in the back. Okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, to build on like the narrative of like if you have a, to me the most compelling idea for stable coins right now for someone in crypto is to be able to put it into a lending protocol and borrow a stable coin against it and then use that in actual, in an actual use case. You get you keep your your exposure to crypto. You can potentially avoid a tax yep. event. Talk to a lawyer. But um, do you ever see yourself getting to the point where you might actually, in addition to allowing people to do that off ramp through PayPal, but maybe direct natively integrate with. DeFi protocols, so not just have DeFi protocols integrate with you, but the other way around, which might be an open question, but kind of like what Coinbase or others do with some limited DeFi protocols as well. Um, it's an area that we've looked at uh, behind you on the left. It, it is an area that we've looked at. I wouldn't say that we're, we've looked at it extensively to date. Um, you know, there are, um, there have been a lot of interesting activity in the lending and the staking space, especially around regulation. And we do, um, we do take care to make sure that we are doing everything in a way that uh, fulfills our obligations to our, to our regulators. Um, it's absolutely, like we absolutely understand that people want their money to be working for them. Um, and so that's, you know, that, that, that area is definitely something that we've been looking at. Um, but we have, to your point, um, uh, been working with partners that that will then allow for PYUSD in their own products and, and services to be uh, to generate yield and to be able to uh, be staked and loaned out. Um, whether we do that internally uh, on platform, not sure. Go over here. Yeah, uh, my question is on um, just r regulatory incentives with on ramps and off ramps. Yep. Um, you know, one of the best use cases of stablecoin is the ability to 
um, obviously send money easily across borders and then uh, help people in many emerging markets protect their wealth from inflation. Um, the challenge is uh, you know, people want access to US dollar or US dollar equivalents. Absolutely. Um, but uh, that creates an economic risk to central banks and these countries. And so uh, wondering if you've seen you know, incentive systems where uh, you can actually have on-ramps and off-ramps where people can access USD easily or USDC easily or any stable coin, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, how, how do you get like you know central banks and countries to actually agree to say okay hey yes, come set up your own right on prime and you know operate from here? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm sorry, your name is Polan. Polan. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that there's so we're seeing I think a couple of different avenues to that. Um, you know, there are countries where remittances are a significant portion of GDP. Um, places like the Philippines, um, you know, por portions of Central America, and uh, uh, certainly in Africa, and you know, w we see a great desire in many of those central banks and, and governments to be able to facilitate the easier movement of funds into those countries because it's such a vital portion of their economies and such a vital lifeline for the people, uh, for their citizenry. Um, there are concerns among others around dollarization of their economies. There is a concern around you know, uh, losing control of monetary policy if, if a significant portion of, of, of funds is kept in, in, in foreign currencies or foreign to them currencies. Um, and I think that central banks and governments are starting to, to work through sort of what those are. You see some like Argentina that are like, Look, we're just going to go to the dollar and, and and be done with it. I'm not sure that that will actually happen, but you, you know, there's that's sort of one extreme, or um, you know, the 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 uh, you know the, the Bitcoin uh, uh, as legal tender and some other other places. Um, but you know, I think that we found that uh, central banks and regulators in those in those countries are. Um, very interested in making sure that there is an efficient way for funds to be able to move into those countries and then for them to be able to either move into local currencies or into sort of the, the regional banking and financial systems. Um, we work with a number of partners uh, and, and firms out there that are facilitating exactly that. So, you know, we've talked about Yellow Card, but there's um, uh, uh, um, CoinPH in, in the Philippines. Uh, that's not right, it's Coin. Uh, yeah, Zcash and, and, and others that form some of those off-ramps as regulated entities in those organizations. Um, but, you know, again, the, the, there's a lot of local knowledge uh, and local sort of interactions that are, are necessary there. Uh, and that's actually one of the reasons why we think that it's important for these to be open standards. Um, you know, if we had to build an off-ramp into every sort of country that was necessary, like, we would be here 20 years from now, and we would only be halfway done. Um, but the fact that you can move that to any compatible wallet, again, which is one of the reasons why we started with the RC20, um, allows for those local providers to be able to work with those local uh, within those local areas. And we've seen a lot of success from people that are that are starting to do that. Open questions, maybe here in the back. And you can also move forward. Like, it's OK. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I was wondering uh, what you think on any given weekday, the percent chance that the US government decides that uh, stable coins are illegal and uh, decides to civil asset forfeiture uh, all the funds backing PayPal USD. And what, what's the percent chance that that happens on any given weekday? Because they would never do it on a weekend. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, I think that the FDIC likes to do things like after, after uh, banking hours on Fridays, right? So maybe they would do it on a weekend. Um, I, I would say that I think that that, speaking only for myself and not as a lawyer or any of those things, I, I think that that is incredibly small. Um, we are, as I said, you know, and, and uh, Paxos is regulated as, uh, by New York DFS. It's a, it's a, it's a New York trust. Um, you know, the ways in which the f reserve funds are titled and held are in the name of the token holders, so they actually belong to people that are holding the tokens. Um, and 
uh, for that reason, it is not, it would not be a claim against Paxos and it would not be a claim against PayPal. It would be a claim against citizens and token holders, um, which number one, makes that a much more dicey sort of proposition from a regulatory standpoint to go and seize those funds. Um, secondarily, as I said, you know, we've gone through a lot of work in, in, in working with policymakers and regulators across the ecosystem for uh, getting to PYUSD. Um, and we're very confident in the regulatory structure that exists. We are on top of some of the emerging uh, draft legislation. Um, none of that seems to suggest that there is going to be a mass extinction event for stablecoins, um, certainly not U.S. issued stablecoins anytime soon. Um, so I, would, I wouldn't put it at zero because you can never be 100% sure, but I would, I, I would put that at a fairly small point. Elon, I don't know if you have any. Yeah, I think your points were spot on there, um, especially around the, the claim against the citizens themselves instead of you know either PayPal or Paxos because of the way we have our treasury uh, set up and the fact that all of the assets are bankruptcy remote. What would you put the percentage at? Uh, I would put it higher than zero and uh, I think the RWA folks, many of them here today are lying about the percent chance that that could happen. And also civil asset forfeiture and in the United States means uh, if you're accused of a crime or the, the people using your, your uh, stable coins are accused of a crime, that your civil assets, you know, cash or uh, cash equivalents, like the things backing PayPal USD can be seized without, uh, without saying what that crime is or, or actually, um, or actually uh, you know, saying PayPal committed a crime. So I think uh, that's a, a quite a high risk. Um, and also to be clear, like there is no legal regulatory framework for stable coins. That doesn't exist yet uh, in the US. The Senate is working on one. Um, but to say like that we're following the 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 regulation or uh, you know rules around stable coins, there aren't any. Um, so uh, until there are, I think that is still like increases the risk still. Yep. So if I would peg you down to a number, greater than zero, but lower than L lower than one percent. Okay. But probably at least point one percent. Okay. So maybe if there's you know one thousand days in the next three years on any one of those, uh, it could just you know be seized for that particular day. Fair enough. Other questions? Op let's open it up to you. Yeah, in the back. Uh, I have a quick question. Like, uh, how could you differentiate between the F uh, Pi USD and uh, USDC? Like, how could you do? You have any special unique features? better than the USDC, kind of like a, make it different? Yeah, I think that that's similar to the question that, that came up earlier. I mean, from a straight token perspective, there's not a ton of differentiation in the structure of the token or the smart contract uh, between those, those areas. I think that the differentiation comes in in terms of things like how the reserves are managed and audited uh, and, and, and transparent. Uh, they come in the use cases that we enable through the PayPal platform and other, other partners and platforms that are there. Um, the uh, acceptance that you can now use that to pay at you know, 30 million PayPal merchants around the world. Uh, and the fact that our focus around PayPal USD is really around driving some of these uh, utility payment use cases um, that really bring some of those additional layers on top of whether that's around the disputes management, whether that's around the customer service uh, and other sorts of things that, um, you know, we've been doing on the fiat space now for many, many years. Um, so, you know, I think that if you were looking at it strictly as a, a set of protocols or a set of, of, of interactions on the blockchain, you know, it, it's a fairly vanilla token. Uh, and as I said, that, that is at, at this moment anyway, by design. Um, there are some things that we're looking at in the future that we think will make it more efficient for payments, more effective for some of these other use cases, uh, and I'm just going to have to ask you to stay tuned for some of those. Oh, I already started using the Pi USD, so awesome. the PayPal app. Yeah. How, how are you using it? Uh, basically, uh, I just uh, deposit USD and uh, get a Pi USD, then go to the on chain. Got so it. So that yeah, the only thing is like uh, I think it's hiding a lot of like. Uh, 
uh, on-chain things. Like you, you don't see the gas fee, right? It's only show like a, yeah, I think it's in a good way or a bad way. Sometimes you don't even know how much gas fee you know, pay. So it's kind of like hiding the complex, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, another question back there. Yeah, um, I don't know if you mentioned it earlier. Uh, I might have missed the beginning, but uh, are there any new chains that you're gonna support uh, in terms of PayPal USD and what can we sort of look forward to on that side of things? So uh, I can absolutely confirm that we will support additional chains. Um, we haven't uh, announced what those are yet. In fact, we took a little bit of a poll earlier uh, around the chains that you'd like to see. Uh, I think we heard Solana and Arbitrum and uh, ZK and Ethereum Classic um, and Polygon. Um, if you have others to add to the list, please send those along. Um, but um, you know, one of the things that we absolutely understand is that um, we started with Ethereum because of the ubiquity and the, and the distribution and the ease of integration. Um, we understand that, the, that gas fees are uh, uh, disappointing. Um, we understand that there are uh, more efficient uh, protocols and there are ones that are more suited to specific industries and specific verticals. So those are definitely things that we're looking at. Cool, thank you. Uh, we'll go over here first and then Yep. Um, I'm Emily. I'm with Paxos. I'm a little bit biased, but I recently had to register my car and I paid with PYOSD in Colorado, which is like kind of cool. Um, but more interested in what like the merchant reaction has been, any pushback, any positive negatives, and just like framing it from the merchant perspective, how are they um, reacting to PYOSD? You know, I think merchants are, I, I would say, cautiously optimistic. Um, and I'll, I'll share a story um, which really caught me by surprise. But, you know, there was a lot of activity, especially a few years back, around merchants wanting to accept Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, and uh, I would be in conversations with a lot of these, especially larger merchants, and their technical and engineering teams would be very excited about this, and their CFOs would be very, very not excited about this because they were sort of in a place where you know, they could accept some number of Bitcoin for a pair of sneakers, and by the time that that actually settled into their accounts, it was either worth a lot more than they sold the speakers, sneakers for, or a lot less than they sold the sneakers for. Um, and that's probably still true uh, in terms of sort of native settlement. Um, so, you know, I think folks are excited about, at the merchant level, are excited about the idea that they can take advantage of digital, the speed and the safety and the transparency of digital payments without the volatility. Um, but the story I was alluding to, which was really interesting, was that there was one retailer, um, sort of a, 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 a large, we'll call it a large electronics retailer. Um, and some of you may know that when you go online and you want to buy, you know, I don't know, a, a camera or a TV or whatever, that there are so-called minimum selling prices. So this is that the manufacturer of the TV will actually prevent the retailer from advertising a price lower than X. Um, I'm told that many of those contracts are only specified in fiat currencies. Um, and so this retailer was particularly excited because they saw this as an advantage where they could say, well, look, if I price this thing in, in PYUSD, I'm not subject to any of those restrictions in my, in my sales contracts. I, again, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not in retail, I don't know how, how, how valid this is. But it gives you an idea of how retailers are actually starting to think through the implications of what digital currencies do. Uh, and I thought that was particularly interesting because here is one that was, that was actually like really thinking hard about not just it's cheaper for me to process, it's faster for me to settle, but also it gives me sort of optionality that I didn't have in the fiat space. So, and we had a question over here. Yeah, so uh, sorry if you talked about this before, but um, for Paxos, could you explain what exactly happened with BUSD? What did you guys learn with that? And as someone that would be using a Paxos supported product, how do I, you know, like what you learned from that and the confidence I have that that won't happen to the next asset? Sure. Um, yeah, so I'll first state that I am an engineering manager at Paxos. So. Um, understand that with with my answer here. 
The thing that I actually took away from the BUSD experience was a story of success, to be honest, um, in the way that we unwound billions of dollars of assets with no problems, right? Like $25 billion of, of assets with no problem. Um, maybe Tether could do that now with the price of everything going up, but I don't know if they could have done that before, yeah. right? So I think that just um, speaks to the, the trustworthiness that we have gained in the space in the way that we were able to handle it. I won't speak about whether or not it was fair, whether or not it should have happened, whether or not it maybe is even legal, but um, I am proud of the way that we uh, handled it in the end there. Any other final questions? I'm not sure how we're doing on time as well. I can shoot a final question if that's the last one. Um, yeah. So on the regulatory uh, point of view, I mean, we obviously have the NYDFS. You have your own regulators. I mean, how, how does that space work? Do, you, do these regulators have to talk to each other now? Like, or do they trust each other? Or, you know, I mean, let's say, you know, there was a question about the remittance payment. Now let's say you talk to another regulator in somewhere in Korea or whoever, you know. Do they have to now talk to DF the NYDFS? How does that work? Lots of, lots of regulatory questions these days. Um, well, that, that's, that's the setting point I heard, right? That's what is different to the USD. Yeah, no, look, I think, um, so first of all, regulators do talk to each other. I mean, they just do as a matter of course um, because they want to understand where the trends are and, and, and what they should be looking at. Um, there are a few, quote unquote, marquee regulators around the world that sort of set the standards for, for and, and, and sort of serve as the gold standard for other regulators to look at. These are the ones that you've heard of. So these are New York DFS for crypto, uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore uh, in, in the Asia uh, PAC region. Um, uh, depending upon where you are, things like the uh, Financial Conduct Authority in the UK or, or, or uh, various entities in Europe. And so, um, they talk to each other both informally and formally. So there are a number of sort of forums that, you know, things like the Bank of International Settlements or others that, that regulators sort of routinely work to uh, engage with other regulators around. Um, but, you know, what we found is that regulators are also very interested in learning about this space. Some of them know more than others. Some of them are um, more savvy and have done more experiments and pilots than others. Some of them are much more willing to just say, look, if it's, if it's good with the US or if it's good with Singapore or if it's good with whatever, we'll just do whatever they do. Um, and so, you know, the, the complication I think with stable coins is that there is an intersection between the traditional financial system, particularly around things like reserve management and on ramps and off ramps and the digital currency and crypto space. And so there are a lot of folks that get involved. We've, before launching PYUSD, spoke with literally dozens of uh, entities and, and regulators and policymakers around the world about sort of what we were doing. Um, and that interaction and that, and that uh, exchange, I think, is just going to get tighter as things go on. But I also think that as regulators see more of these use cases, that they see that there's value and utility around them, that it's not just pump and dump schemes and, you know, terrorist financing and things like that, that they will start to um, engage on the utility side as much as they will on the control side. So I think that we are coming up on time. Um, while I'm taking away that um, from this that that the regulatory side is, is, is at least something that you all are curious about, um, that additional protocols are something that you'd like to see us uh, pursue uh, and uh, across a wide variety of, of, of protocols, um, that you are interested in the direct integrations uh, with dApps and, and, and DeFi um, rather than through some of these other, uh, other agencies and that you know, hopefully you will engage with us uh, as we go to help uh, craft a stable coin that's really going to work for all of you. Please uh, take a look at the faucet at faucet.paxos.com. Please send us any, uh, um, any other suggestions or thoughts that we have. We really want to be here with you, uh, and we really want to be building this with you to make it uh, the stable coin of choice for payments in your applications. And please do take a beanie because it's cold outside. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your show.